anything, if you wish to record, please indicate in the chat. And with that, over to you, Lorna, in five, four, three, two. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to our weekly COVID-19 public health update with Montgomery County Executive Mark Elrich. I'm Lorna Vigili, Hispanic Public Information Officer, and joining us today is Dr. James Bridgers, who is an acting health officer for the county, Dr. Earl Stoddard, Assistant Chief Administrative Officer, as well as Sean O'Donnell, who's Program Administrator of Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Response for the Department of Health and Human Services. And also joining us from the Department of Health and Human Services is Dr. Raymond Crowell. And last but not least, Council Member Craig Rice. Welcome, thank you for joining us today. Members of the media, we will commence with a presentation uh, from the County Executive and also from the Council Member. Then we'll open it up for Q&A for that particular topic and then move on with the COVID-19 public health update. And with that, good afternoon to you, Mr. County Executive, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, before we start with our update, um, I just want to acknowledge the passing of uh, Sydney Kramer. Um, Sydney worked for the residents of Montgomery County as a council member and a state senator before he became Montgomery County's third executive and he served as executive from 1986 to 1990. His energy, passion, and willingness to speak frankly on important issues like education, business policy, and mental health were a part of his contributions to this community. And he'll also be remembered as a strong advocate for seniors. My thoughts are with Sydney's children, Miriam Rona and Ben Kramer, who have continued their father's legacy of public service, as well as to his grandchildren. May he rest in peace after serving his community so well for so long. I want to take a moment to comment on the shooting um, in Buffalo this weekend. It's had a profound effect on many people in America. This, like many of the other mass shootings, um, the effect goes beyond the immediate victims in the immediate community. Now, 10 people were killed in a grocery store in Buffalo, New York. Countless others have been traumatized by the attack. It not only targeted the innocent, but was also motivated by hate. The police discovered that the man they've arrested for the crime drove hours to get to that supermarket because he wanted to target the Black community. And that was the purpose of his trip, to find the most impact that he could possibly have. It's the kind of detail that prompted President Joe Biden to call the shooting terrorism when he visited Buffalo on Tuesday. And it is terrorism. When you kill people randomly, um, when you do it out of hate, it leaves everybody very insecure about what world are we living in. Um, people should be able to feel free and safe about moving when they're coming to moving about in their communities. And this is the kind of event that just strikes fear into people. And we can't allow this to be tolerated or become normalized. Uh, replacement theory, which motivated this person is pure garbage. There's no replacement of anyone planned. And if people are concerned about replacement theory, the last replacement event in North America was when native people were replaced by Europeans. That's real replacement along with the demonization of critical race theory, otherwise known as history to most of us, these attacks are an effort to build on our efforts to build an inclusive and unbiased community where all are valued and all are safe. We agree with the president when he calls on the nation to give hate no safe harbor. Montgomery County will provide no safe haven for hate, and we will aggressively pursue and prosecute perpetrators of hate crimes. During the pandemic and before it, Montgomery County has seen its share of hate crimes. There is never a good excuse to target any group, whether it be Asian Americans, Hispanics, the LGBTQ community, Muslims, African Americans, or anybody else. The Montgomery County State's Attorney's Office has launched an initiative to make it easier for victims of hate crimes to come forward and report these incidents, but sadly we know that many will not. We have links to the county website that can help identify what a hate crime is under state law and what to do, do if you believe you've witnessed one or experienced one. Let's keep what happened in Buffalo in mind as we move forward and remember that hate has no home in Montgomery County. 
On a happier note, I'm pleased to be joined today by Councilmember Craig Rice so we can discuss an exciting new opening. Craig and I were proud to be there this past weekend to launch Ignite Hub at Montgomery College in Rockville. As of Monday, reservations are now being taken for kids, teens, and adults to begin using this new facility for information technology, coding, and other lessons that will help us adapt to a changing world and be ready to lead the way forward. This is an amazing opportunity for people to learn about coding, to learn about um, what can what you can do with it, and it's going to inspire, you know, more people. When I was there, I was, you know, I saw programs that some of the students had already created um, that had actual, you know, real value um, that would help people do things as they maneuver this increasingly electronic world. So it's a very exciting place. Montgomery County has many partners to thank for the bringing the Ignite online, including Montgomery College, MCPS, and Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation. Um, and we're very, very fortunate to be partnering with Apple on this project. Apple has donated most of the equipment, which makes up the labs and the learning space for the Ignite Hub. Craig was really instrumental in helping bring this all together. And, and actually to continue working on it through COVID and everything else to make sure that it happened. His work on behalf of Montgomery County on broadband issues paved the way for all of us to benefit, not only is Craig making a difference here in Montgomery County, but across the nation. During his role on the National Association of Counties, NACO, on the board of directors, Craig chairs the Human Services and Education Policy Steering Committee and also served as co-chair for NACO's National Broadband Task Force to bridge the digital divide. The work we're doing here um, and the Craig is sharing with our peer counties, large and small, urban and rural. Uh, we're very fortunate to have him working with us on this critical issue. And I'm going to now give him an opportunity to talk a little bit about it because you, know, you really played a major role in making this happen. And then we'll come back to the COVID update. So Craig. Well, thank you very much, Mr. County Executive. And I really wanna thank you for your support as well. Obviously, when it comes to projects like this, uh, it's one thing for a loan council member to try and push something forward. It's another thing to have the backing of everyone in the community, including our county executive who understands just how important this is. Uh, this hub was born out of an idea, an idea about making sure that some of the opportunities that I had growing up, coming up through the magnet program, the very first math, science, computer science magnet program here in Montgomery County at Tacoma Park and learning coding on an Apple IIe computer and logo would be something that would not be a unique experience to many who look like me in this community. Uh, it certainly is something that wasn't lost on me being the son of a teacher uh, who had all of the educational opportunities that allowed for me to be able to dream big. And we know what happens when we allow our children to dream big and we give them opportunities. They succeed and they fly high. And so it really was something where that was the impetus for this Ignite Hub, working with Apple, with Montgomery County Public Schools, with Montgomery College, with the Montgomery County Economic Development uh, Corporation to really come together to say, how can we break this uh, cycle of people of color and of lower socioeconomic status, oftentimes not being involved in technological pathways. And the best way for us to do this was to get them immersed into the technology through the Montgomery King Code program. Through that Montgomery King Code program that started three years ago with just uh, a little over a hundred students, it has now grown to over a thousand students. It's also grown to, uh, to where we have coding clubs in many of our uh, schools. We also have coding camp. Uh, and now we have the Ignite Hub, a place where Montgomery can code, can call home, but also more importantly, something that represents to the overall community that you are not forgotten when we talk about the technological age and the age of coding. We've also remembered our incarcerated, those that are incarcerated and created the Coding Our Way Home program. I again wanna thank the county executive for his continuous support budgetarily, as well as uh, with his overall, just uh, working with our elected leaders uh, throughout the area and also our department heads to ensure that everyone rallied behind this project. Uh, this could not have been done alone. Uh, this was a team effort. And we should be very proud of the fact that Apple is looking at Montgomery County as a shining example of how to make sure that we're breaking the digital divide. There's more to come on this. This is just the beginning, uh, but it is the very beginning 
of a great opportunity where I think this Ignite Hub will actually serve as Apple's North Star when it comes to what it is that we do to ensure that we have coding and technological uh, connections for all in our community. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, Mr. County Executive. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member. Members of the media, do you have any questions either for the County Executive and or the Council Member regarding this particular topic? Ignite? Just giving you a minute. No? Well, well one more, yes. One more, very quickly, I just wanted to chime in on one more piece of it. So uh, on last Monday, I was at uh, the White House with the president and vice president in the Rose Garden as they announced the broadband affordable connectivity uh, programs new iteration. And I just hope that all of the media report on this. I just did an interview this morning with Radio Dia uh, in Espanol uh, to make sure that all of our Spanish speaking uh, members of the community are briefed on this very important iteration. What it does is it's uh, an agreement with over 20 of our largest internet service providers that actually has them giving uh, service at 100 megabits per second upload and download. That is an incredibly fast speed and will uh, really help a lot of folks in the community remain connected. Now that $30 is actually then offset by the federal government subsidy uh, as long as they are eligible for free or reduced meals, SNAP, WIC, EBT, and the like. We need to make sure that all of our residents who are eligible are signing up for this very important program. Some of them have internet connectivity now and are paying exorbitant prices. We want to make sure that we lower the price so that they can use that for so many other things that we see are increasing in price right now, whether it's gas, infant formula, uh, food, the whole nine yards. Uh, so we wanna make sure that we're giving people the opportunity uh, to do so. The website is www.getinternet.gov. Again, www.getinternet.gov. 20 providers, including ours that we know very well, Verizon and Comcast here in the area uh, that are uh, uh, participating in this program that is incredibly important. Uh, to our community when it comes to bridging the digital divide. So just wanted to put that out there as well. If folks can please just mention it uh, on their broadcast uh, so that our constituents know about this vital program that's gonna help uh, connect so many of our residents to affordable, high-speed, high-quality internet. So thank you, Lorna. Thank you, Council Member. I would like to ask members of the media, do you have any questions regarding this last update granted by the council member? No? Okay, thank you for joining us today, council member Craig Rice. Thank you, and uh, we'll move forward now with a public health update, Mr. County Executive. Thank you, Craig, again. Um, so back to our COVID update this week, um, our rates continue uh, to increase and they've now exceeded over 350 cases per 100,000 residents. Our positivity rate and hospital, hospitalization rates also continue to increase. And these numbers do not account for the unreported cases that are being identified through rapid testing. You know, people who have these rapid tests at home, um, if they get positive cases or negative cases, they're dealing with them um, for the most part inside their homes and we're not getting notified of results. And so we're just not able to capture the, as much of the picture as we did before when we were the ones actually giving the tests. But it's good that people are getting tested, however it happens. It just impedes our ability to get a better view of the data. Uh, we're currently leading the state in case rates, um, but we have the lowest test positivity rate in the state, which means that we're testing at a much higher rate than our neighboring jurisdictions are. And hence we're discovering more cases. I, this is a time for increased vigilance. We released a statement earlier this week reiterating the message um, that we've been consistently saying for months now. Voluntary mask wearing is encouraged when you're in public indoor spaces for prolonged periods of time. Um, health uh, experts say that BA 2.1.2.1 appears to have a transmission rate that's higher than many of the previous strains we've seen. And as you can see from this chart, the variant is now 55% of the cases that are seen in our region. So another variant is you know, sweeping through 
The region, even before the other one, has left completely. Outbreaks in schools statewide are up 85% from last week. All total cases tied to schools across Maryland are up more than 60% over the last seven days. And yesterday, only one MCPS school had more than 10% of its student population test positive for COVID, but many are close to that mark. Uh, we encourage everyone to pick up free home test kits available at all county libraries, as well as other locations. Despite rising case counts, Montgomery County is in a much better place than we were during some of the previous waves. Montgomery County is one of the highest vaccination rates in the nation, and viral treatments for COVID are now available, which should have a positive impact on hospitalization and fatality numbers as this latest wave of cases continues. Uh, our messages to parents is to keep your kids and yourselves up to date on vaccinations. If the time has come to get a booster shot, please do it. Um, the effectiveness of the shot fades over time. Up-to-date vaccines help prevent quarantines, and they can help the com help us combat the, um, the amount of community spread that we've already seen. And it has put us in, a, in the moderate risk category. So we are still continuing to do everything we can to encourage people to get vaccinated uh, so we can uh, have the most effective effort at minimizing the spread of this variant. Since January, people 50 years and older who were not vaccinated, who were vaccinated but not boosted, I should say, were two to three times more likely to be hospitalized from COVID than those who were fully boosted. So there is a difference that the booster makes. We can see it in our hospitalization rates. Um, so again, please, if you're not boosted yet, get boosted. Just yesterday, the FDA approved Pfizer's request for a COVID booster shot for kids between five and or five and up, and we expect CDC and Maryland Department of Health approval in the next few days. The county is going to be ready to take advantage of that challenge, just as we have with COVID testing and other rounds of immunization. We don't want to reach the high category again. We don't want to see any more of our friends and our neighbors worry about the loved ones because of this virus. And frankly, we don't want to have to limit occupancy of events or occupancy of buildings. Um, we would like not to have to shut things down. Uh, so we know how effective that can be, but we also know that if we do masking right and we do it consistently, uh, we can avoid going there. So uh, I encourage people um, to do everything you can to keep us on the safest track possible. And finally, I want to acknowledge that this is both National Police Week and EMS Week. Uh, very grateful and thankful to the efforts of all first responders who are out working 24 hours a day, every, every day, every week. And this year's is very special for MCPD, which is celebrating its 100th anniversary. Last weekend, they held a community day event at the fairgrounds that attracted thousands of people who were able to meet and engage with our officers. I'm glad that I was able to stop by and see for myself the positive engagement that they were having with people in this community. I'm gonna turn this over now to Dr. Um, Stoddard and Sean for their updates. Who's gonna go first, Sean or uh, Dr. Stoddard? John can go first and I may just have a few comments depending on- Okay, what. great. Sorry, I, I needed to unmute myself before I shared my screen. I couldn't find the unmute. Okay. Uh, so we'll go through, we have a lot of information today. Um, I, I'll try to go through um, fairly quickly. Uh, uh, Mr. Elrich already shared the uh, updated case rate and hospitalization rates from the CDC's, uh, 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 with the metrics that the CDC looks at. Uh, so what we'd like to do is sh share today some of the guidance that comes from the CDC and comes from uh, the local health department about what that means because we're in, in medium. We've been in medium now for uh, over a week and we just wanna reiterate um, that it's very important uh, as the county executive said, to stay up to date with your COVID-19 vaccines. These are really making a, a big difference in uh, the seriousness of illness related uh, if, if you happen to contract COVID. So 
very important to stay up to date. Uh, wear a well-fitting mask around others. Uh, the CDC recommends, again, at Medium, that, uh, of course, we all know if you have symptoms or a positive test or you are in quarantine for exposure to wear that mask uh, until the symptoms subside, until uh, you've reached 10 days for isolation or quarantine. Uh, the CDC also recommends to wear it when on public transportation. It's, uh, it's not only courteous to do that, but it really can help to um, keep people safe. You don't know who might be at high risk who's on that public transportation with you. So please wear a mask right now when we're in this high transmission or medium community level uh, and on public transportation. And additionally, as, our, our, as Dr. Bridgers has, has said, um, and as we're strongly recommending from um, public health, wear masks when you're in those congregate indoor spaces um, with limited social distancing and ventilation. It again can really uh, help to protect not only you, but the other folks in the, those spaces. So again, these are the recommendations from public health um, consistent with the CDC guidance. Again, reminding people to get tested if you have symptoms or um, are alerted that you've been exposed. If uh, a contact lets you know that they are positive, uh, please get tested. You know, we want to identify the cases and stop the transmissions. If you're returning from travel or you've been to a large gathering, that's a good time to, to do testing as well. And if you have a positive test result, just be reminded uh, that universal contact tracing is not happening. Not every single person with a positive result is going to get a call. Um, many people are doing rapid tests and those results are not always reported. Uh, so, you know, they, there's no way for us to contact you, uh, even if you're at high risk. So it is incumbent on you to let your, your close contacts know if you have a positive result. And finally, if you're at high risk for severe illness from COVID-19, uh, again, it's recommended you wear a mask when you're in those indoor public settings. And we're also uh, recommending talk to your healthcare provider before you have a positive test. Talk to your healthcare provider to determine if you're a good candidate for one of the therapeutic uh, treatments. That way you'll know if you have a positive test, you'll already know um, what you might be looking for and whether to contact your provider then or possibly go to a test to treat location or another site. Uh, so just to follow up on those therapeutics, uh, we were in conversation with our state partners yesterday. They've assured us that the supply of these therapeutics is plentiful. Um, there is lots of Paxlovid that have come in to uh, Maryland and providers have a mechanism uh, to look up where the, where the where that supply of Paxlovid is. So when they write a prescription, these are prescription therapeutics. When they write a prescription, they can, uh, again, know where to send their, um, their patients to get that prescription filled. Uh, the eligibility for this, just reminding folks, is you, you need to be symptomatic, have a positive test, and be within the five days of the onset of symptoms. Again, the Paxlovid is just for those who are 12 and up, and you need to weigh at least 40 uh, kilograms. Um, and Paxlovid is being recommended for those at risk for progression to severe COVID-19. So it's those, those standard underlying conditions that put you at greater risk, including age, um, and potentially if, if you are not uh, up to date on, on vaccinations and with those risk categories. Uh, the reason we're, we're, we're trying to spread the word on this is the, the data has shown that Paxlovid can help to have an 88 percent reduction in hospitalization and death. Um, and that, again, may be a reason why we're seeing fewer people end up in hospitals now, in addition to the high vaccination rates. Uh, there are some other medications that uh, have been approved and um, that providers may consider and may be a good fit. And again, there's Evasheld, which is the, uh, the pre-exposure prophylaxis for those who are moderate or severely immunocompromised over 12, uh, that they can get that, um, that monoclonal antibody and that will help protect them um, in, in ways that uh, vaccines are not fully protecting every um, moderate or severely immunocompromised individuals. They're still recommended to get the vaccines, but this is an, another um, option to, to increase protection. Uh, the county has this morning updated its, uh, its web pages to have a therapeutics page now. Uh, we include information about 
uh, where to go for tests to treat if you're in those high risk categories. Um, and uh, you, you can potentially have a very uh, quick or expedited way to get tested if it comes back positive. Those pharmacies uh, and locations can fill that prescription right there and, and start you on the uh, a treatment. Um, additionally, if you don't have a healthcare provider that can um, can screen you and write a prescription, there is an, uh, an online or a, um, uh, a phone service you can call and they will free of charge review your information and determine if you're a candidate as well. So we'll continue to update this the webpage um, with additional information about therapeutics and build this out uh, again to try to connect our population with this really important piece of the COVID response. So going into, uh, again, our, our data, I know our county executives already covered the, the lower transmission rates in our county, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the lower po test positivity rates. The transmission rates are very high. Uh, currently, our hospitalization rates continue to be much lower. Uh, the census we did on Monday had 87 hospitalized patients uh, with COVID diagnosis. Um, we saw a, a, a modest increase in the acute care beds at our, our primary hospitals from 40 to 47 and two additional ICU patients. Again, these increases are much, much lower than what we've seen um, compared to the, the transmission rates that we're looking at. Uh, the biggest increase has been an additional 20 patients who were transferred to the alternate care site in Tacoma Park, the Adventist um, Hospital alternate care site. And again, these patients, um, some of which were transferred from county hospitals, some from um, other county hospital outside of our county hospitals. Uh, but that is the biggest increase in, in the hospitalized patients currently. Uh, we, again, just sharing with you the, the um, data on COVID related deaths uh, through the uh, first week and a half of May, um, we have seven reported deaths in the county related to COVID. This is a slight trend upwards from the previous month and is likely reflecting again that increase in cases that we've seen uh, over uh, April and um, unfortunately uh, resulting in, in a um, slightly more than a half dozen deaths uh, to date. Again, this is this data take, can take a while to come in and um, we, we are uh, hoping that this will continue to stay low. Uh, obviously, Compared to the, the previous Omicron spike um, seen there in January, um, a much lower death rate than, than we saw with that previous spike. Um, and we're, we're again, hoping that it remains low. Uh, just to, to reiterate, um, of course, uh, the, the lower hospitalization and death rates for those who are staying up to date on their vaccinations, um, we're really hoping that our, our residents continue to hear this and continue to come out uh, to get those boosters. Uh, one thing that we'll talk about, I know we mentioned in previous weeks, the um, how this wave is, has been going a bit longer than, um, than, we, than our initial models predicted. Uh, as you can see from the, from the variant proportions that have been uh, identified through the CDC for our region, you see the growing number of uh, the BA2.12 strain. Um, as uh, Dr. Stoddard mentioned last week uh, in relation to these questions, that there are multiple variants going on now and that could be complicating this. Uh, when we look at our data um, from some of the other states, uh, you can see how many of those states, uh, especially we're looking at some of the New England ones here, um, many of those states had a, a gradual increase and then with a, a, sharp, um, a sharp trend up over recent weeks. Uh, similar a little bit to what we're seeing here in Montgomery County, that could well be um, the BA2 variant with the modest uh, increases and then the, the BA2.12 uh, causing uh, a, a greater spike, a higher transmission rate um, over the last, uh, last few weeks. Uh, this is from the, the New York Times um, webpage. And they, uh, one thing that they do is, is to give us context, they compare the, the current cases, hospitalizations, and deaths to uh, the previous high point, not, not inclusive of the, the, this 
winter's Omicron, but the previous high point, which was last winter. And for context, you can see in New York State, for example, their cases are at 70% of that previous uh, peak, but their hospitalizations are only at 34% of the previous peak and their, their deaths are only at 11%. So you can see that this wave is, this provides us some good context of how this wave is playing out with a uh, high, with high number of cases, but much lower percentage of hospitalizations and deaths. And um, we've included the Maryland uh, data here as well. Um, you know, it's, it's currently uh, lower than some of these New England uh, territories. Um, and it's, again, we're, we're predicting we may continue to go up for another week or two um, with, our, with our case transmissions. Um, again, we're tracking. We do think that uh, potentially New York and some of the New England areas uh, may be a little bit ahead of us in the, in the, the BA2 and BA2.12 um, transmissions. So um, hopefully this will give us some idea of, of when our transmissions may break. Uh, looking at the, the global uh, cases, we have the US uh, country nationwide, we are up 31% in cases from the previous seven days, um, whereas much of the rest of the world is, is seeing um, uh, mostly declines uh, overall in, in the overall COVID transmissions. One chart that um, we've been looking at and we wanted to share with you this week, uh, this is within Montgomery County. Again, it's a ratio uh, the, of the cases to, of the new cases to the hospital census. So just uh, keep in mind new cases, uh, there's going to be one data point for each new case, uh, whereas the hospital census could each uh, week could include people from the previous week, the same person from the previous week. But it's still helpful to look at how that ratio played out. Of course, at the very beginning of this, um, where there was very limited amount of testing, it's not surprising that uh, the ratio is much higher of hospitalizations to the amount of testing that was done um, and, and positives that were identified. But you can see both from the, the, the BA1 spike in December and January, and now even more so with the current um, wave that that hospitalization rate is much lower. Um, the, the orange line being the hospitals corresponds to the, the, the numbers on the right side of this chart, um, whereas the case rates correspond to the left side of the chart. Again, it's just to give us an idea of, of how this wave is playing out differently with severe illness um, compared to cases. Uh, overall vaccination rates uh, have not changed. Um, as our county executive mentioned, uh, the FDA has uh, approved the safety data for a booster shot for the 5 to 11. I believe the CDC is scheduled to meet, um, uh, their ACIP committee is scheduled to meet tomorrow, and I would, I think it would be likely that they will also approve this. Uh, tomorrow is the um, ordering date uh, statewide for vaccine, and we will, uh, the county will be uh, requesting additional amounts of pediatric vaccines, although um, it's been a, a, a slower rate recently. Um, we will ask for more because we do anticipate there will be a bump in interest with, uh, with approved boosters. We just ask um, our families to have a little bit of patience because we do need to wait for the state to deliver that vaccine. Um, one thing to note, uh, you know, we're, our um, vaccination rates for the 5 to 11 um, is around 63%. Uh, 63, 64% um, fully vaccinated. This compares to uh, the, the CDC data that nationally this rate is around 28.6. We're very encouraged that our parents are bringing uh, children out to pr protect them, um, help prevent uh, not only illness and, or shorten illness um, within that age group, uh, but um, also uh, potentially prevent other subsequent uh, uh, impacts, um, potentially long COVID and other things that we don't uh, fully have data on yet and, and how COVID affects uh, these populations. We have seen nationally hospitalizations increase for um, children over the Omicron uh, waves. Um, unfortunately, it, it ha is having a little bit more of an impact, still not a, a high impact, but, but more of an impact than the previous waves. And um, again, just to, to uh, underscore, 
uh, why why it's important. Um, the FDA has identified and the CDC has identified through data that the vaccine effectiveness against COVID wanes after the second dose of the vaccine in all age populations, which is why they're all, all of the ages are um, now being recommended for booster shots. Uh, to share with you what we're seeing at our, our county testing sites, um, we have, uh, for the second week in a row, we've seen about a 20% increase in volume for people coming out to, to get PCR testing, uh, reminding folks that we, they can also pick up and do their own PCR testing, um, register it online, and then drop it back off at, um, at several of the rec, uh, recreation centers and um, at the Dennis Avenue Health Center. Um, we are seeing at our sites a much higher test positivity level than the countywide um, public and private sites. Ours is our test positive positivity level has been around 17%. Uh, reminding folks that they can um, report their home tests. Uh, they, those those uh, rapid tests uh, when reported are, are they're not included in the overall uh, PCR numbers that the state publishes and the CDC uses, but this does allow us to uh, potentially follow up with high-risk individuals and do contact tracing with them and provide them um, uh, guidance and next steps. So we, we still want to um, recommend that people do report their rapid tests when they do them if they're positive, um, because it does give us additional information. Um, and then just reminding folks, I know we are in a period of, again, high transmission um, in our county, and so uh, rapid test kits are still free, still available at our libraries as our um, medical grade masks. We're reminding folks you can come out and pick those up if they need them. Uh, additionally, the, um, the federal program prov providing mailing rapid test kits to people's homes has been renewed. I believe you can um, request up to eight uh, rapid tests this go around to have mailed to your home. So just reminding folks of, of that availability. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Stoddard for additional comments. Just one additional. Uh, so as we announced earlier this month, Maggie Nightingale Library and Pools will be opening this week, actually on Saturday. And I wanted to confirm that they will additionally have rapid tests as the other libraries do. So that'll offer another opportunity for rapid tests for the up county. So I want to make sure that was out there publicly, confirm that with libraries yesterday. So when you when you visit Maggie Nightingale starting this weekend, they'll also you know finish after the renovation they'll have rapid test kits there. Other than that, I think that's all I wanted to include as well. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Let's open it up for the Q and A portion of the presentation. And first up is Dan Shear from uh, Bethesda Beat. Good afternoon, Dan. Hi. Um, this question, um, either Dr. Crowell and, and the county executive can uh, answer as well. But I just wanted to ask about um, the the uh, you know the number of uh, homicides and overall incidents of violent crime that we've seen this year to date, um, and just wanted to hear um, the main concerns that you guys have and what factors you think are behind this steady rise, particularly when it comes to um, violence between teens, um, going off of the, the recent homicides uh, involving teens in Germantown. Yeah, so Dan, I'll, I'll start out that and I'll let uh, the county executive join in uh, as he wishes. Uh, the, it is, we are watching it with and, and working it through with, with the, the police department and with MCPS. We have, we have, uh, we share the, the concern about those numbers. Uh, at, at least a piece of what, what appears to be going on is that we have, uh, um, a couple of things. One, obviously, is the availability, the increased availability of, uh, of firearms, things like ghost guns that are that are showing up on the internet. And we we had during the time we were in in lockdown and pandemic, people with a lot of time on their hands to surf the web, find guns, build them, and 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 use them. And of course, the challenge is that once you've got a weapon, um, it increases the potential, and you're in in a situation it increases the potential that you will use that weapon, um, whether it's for uh, vendettas or for revenge or for, for other criminal activities. Um, the, the other piece that we are seeing across the county and, and across the country to some extent is um, our, our, our young people have been in lockdown like all of us have been isolated, have been working through these virtual media 
And in these kind of media, I can turn off my camera, I can turn off my microphone, I can say what I want to say, and there's nothing, there's no real consequence. But now we're back in person with each other, and the risk of saying something inappropriate or having an inappropriate interaction that turns that turns sour and, and ends up uh, with violence or potentially deadly, um, it seems to be escalating. Um, you know, I think our, our work with, with, with uh, Montgomery County Police and with MCPS has been around trying to find ways that we can help uh, our our, our young people uh, reacclimate to being back in person with each other, to spend time in ways that are, that are socially appropriate, to, to resolve their conflicts in a more peaceful way. Uh, we've had our teams out in the in the streets and in the community, and the law enforcement has, I think, also been out and about trying to find ways to promote peace and decrease the the, the risk of violence and and in our especially in our young population. Thank you. Is that it for you, Dan? County Executive Village, did you want to add anything? Or I mean, I I basically agree with with what he just said. I mean, I think uh, uh, you know, with with the murders, these all seem to be people who know each other. Um, this is, yeah, you know, it's certainly part of a national trend. This is not something that's unique to the county, um, but this kind of sudden spike in I guess in behaviors that say, I'm gonna settle my differences with you with a gun is, is really, I, mean, I think it's alarming to everybody. I do think that COVID um, set a lot of people off. I, I don't think people, you know, there's not like there are comprehensive mental health services out there where people who became, you know, troubled, disoriented from society or disconnected can go and get assistance and find their way back in. Um, and a lot of times, you know, if people's lives aren't going well in general, um, COVID certainly didn't didn't add to that. You know, there are a lot of youth who, you know, do feel disconnected, who don't know what they're going to do with themselves when they get out of school, who don't look at their lives and feel like, you know, we've got great prospects, you know, I'm ready to go back in and build my future. You've got a lot of kids who didn't think they had great futures to start with. And this is just added to it, I think. So I, you know, I believe really strongly we've got to up uh, the mental health ante. I, you know, I've, I think I mentioned this earlier. I've asked um, one of our hospitals to, you know, look look at a model for community clinics because not everything happens in school, and not every young person's in school, and these incidents occur between people. Frankly, plenty of them are people who've been out of school, and so if we only focus on schools, we're going to mix, miss, I think, uh, some of the broader anxiety in the community. So I would like to, to, for us to start exploring what it would take to create a larger mental health presence in the county. I know there are adults who could use this kind of counseling. There are certainly young adults who could use it. And I think we're going to have to start thinking more broadly about how we attack this. And executive, I just wanted to add that, that uh, to your point that the the students and, and schools, when schools end, a lot of the services that are provided in schools can, can end as well. Part of what we're working on is our ways to make sure that our students, our young people have activity and, and ways to engage beyond the end of the school year that, that are healthy and supportive of them to try to address these issues. And the mental health piece is, is one of those things that the country is finally beginning to come to grips with the fact that the system for a long time has been under supported and, and under, uh, under resourced and so you have done some things to try to build that this year. The council has added some things to the budget for this for this coming fiscal year and we will we will use that on behalf of the county residents to try to strengthen our behavioral health system in the county. We also will be, uh, you know, we, we are having a series of meetings internally to discuss exactly how we can uh, bolster some of our efforts in the space. I know council member uh, Rice, uh, council president Auburn O's, uh, public safety chair, uh, cats have all been expressed a lot of interest in trying to identify uh, places where we're being successful and where we can expand programs to address that. I know the street outreach network had a lot of focus in the budget session last week to, from uh, Council Member Navarro as well. So there is a lot of interest in, in, in trying to look at this issue as, as closely as we can, discuss the interventions that are that can work and have worked, and trying to expand those. But we are going to be having a series of meetings um, um, with, with internal staff, with senior, uh, with the elected officials to try and really identify what, what can be successful and how we can, how we can improve uh, what we're doing and offer more of what we're doing. Cause we know that the, as, as uh, 
Dr. Kroll and the county executive alluded to, we know that there's a mental health crisis. We know there's a proliferation of firearms in our communities across the country. Um, and all those things, um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a problematic combination of things that drive these things and are driving them across the country. And we obviously, you know, have things that have worked and we want to make sure that we, we emphasize those. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Next, Kate Ryan, WTOP. Good afternoon, Kate. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. I have a couple of things I want to ask about, and I will kind of uh, try to keep it quick. Um, number one, on the um, masking in schools right now, Montgomery County has a I, what I think is a formula of if there are three cases in a classroom, they will ask that people wear masks in that classroom, or are they requiring? I, I'd, I'd like that cleared up. And have they done this in conjunction with the county, I know they have their own medical officer. Are they getting advice from you or are they simply telling you what they're doing? Um, and uh, what what about a, a requirement? At what point would you see either the schools or the county having to go, all right, we need masks on given the, given the transmissibility of this variant? So Kate, uh, great question. I'll jump in and I'm sure others will will take an opportunity to share their comments because we've all been in this fight together. So no, they aren't telling us what to do or, or what they are doing. We are providing the recommendation based on CDC and MDH regarding mass requirements based on community level spread as well as community level transmissions, which are different that Mr. O'Donnell talked about. The outbreak um, that they are referring to in the recommendation that they have implemented are for uh, particular schools where there are three or more cases or unrelated, or those schools where there are 5% or more of the staff, students, or um, uh, faculty, uh, educators who, um, who are impacted or there is an outbreak. So that's the formula that they've been using. And this formula um, was implemented and, and provided by MSDE and MDH back on March the 2nd. Nothing has change. It was on the tail end of Omicron, and we are managing the response now based on those, uh, the lessons that we've learned during the Omicron spike, now with the sublineages that are out there. So they are recommendations based on those community levels. Now, the second part of your question is, is there a threshold? And I know Steve has often answered this, asked this question before. Based on the community levels, we look at those case rates, 200 cases per 100,000, above and below, and up to the highest level, which is over 500 cases or more. So there's no one particular case metric that we are uh, looking at, we are planning at all levels for community uh, spread based on CDC's current definition, low, medium, and high. And at each of those levels, there are additive um, layer preventative measures that we've talked about that the county executive has um, has made in his remark weekly. So that's, that's the way forward. That's the next normal. And so we are providing recommendations recommendations, but the guidance that's set forth by MCPS is based on their data review, what they're seeing in their individual schools and what they are communicating to um, the principal, staff, and students. Okay. And um, is there a point at which masks would be mandated either within schools or countywide? We have no current recommendations either at the state or county level for indoor mask recommendations. And again, as a reminder, if there is an indoor mask mandate set forth by MCPS, it would be vetted through their Board of Education and or additional guidance from MSDE. If there is an indoor mask mandate, the recommendations for it would come from me as the acting health officer and chief of public health, um, along with the recommendation to the council sitting as a Board of Health and or the county executive for his consideration. Got it. Uh, another thing, uh, Monday, um, we uh, had the briefing with the county council president, and I didn't ask about the health officer, and then we found out that we don't have a health officer, the latest candidate backed out. And Dr. Kroll was kind enough to talk with me about that yesterday. But uh, Mr. Elrich, what are your thoughts on this? We are now without a health officer and uh, Dr. Bridgers, no disrespect at all directed towards you, but a permanent health officer since last September, um, and knowing that this vetting process does take time, what 
what's happening? What do you see the problem here? Um, I think a lot of things are happening. I think um, the health officer job was a lot more attractive when it looked like COVID was going away. Um, as COVID's intensified and people anticipate a return to the kind of, uh, I'd say, public situation that was less than positive, you know, during the height of COVID, I think this makes the job a lot less appealing. I think, you know, we're finding we're in competition with a lot of people trying to hire health officers. Um, that, does, that doesn't help either. And, if, and we find more of them going into the private sector where frankly, they can make policies within a company or within an organization that don't put them in, at risk of public exposure or making public policies. So I think there's kind of like a hesitancy to step into something which is, you know, can be highly controversial. And, and that's, that's a problem. I mean, there are, is a shortage of health officers more generally beyond, you know, beyond Montgomery County. And I just think we're seeing um, a part of it. Got it. And then if, uh, if Mr. Uh, Council Member Rice is still with us, um, I did have a question. I know you are very much in touch with the community that you serve. Uh, and seeing as the violence that we've seen among these very young teens, we're talking 14 and 15 now. We're not talking 18-year-olds or 19-year-olds, which is horrifying enough. Um, what are community members in your community telling you about what they're seeing and what else needs to be done? Well, thank you, Kate, for the question. And I think that, again, when we look at uh, some of the solutions that are there, it involves more than just government. Uh, society has got to play a role in taking back their neighborhoods and their communities as well. Uh, and that's why we had that rally in Germantown at BlackRock to try and encourage folks to make sure that we get out of this notion of not saying anything, not being a part of participating with the police and helping to make our neighborhoods safer. We know that when we solve these cases and lock individuals up that are murdering other people in our community, our community is better as a result. We know the work that we need to do on the front end. We know that we need to provide more opportunities. You heard the county executive talk about that in explicit detail. Uh, the current uh, recommendations with the blueprint for education, CTE pathways, all the things that we've invested in, as well as mental health in schools. But as you heard from the county executive as well, not all of our kids are connected to our schools. Unfortunately, some of them are disconnected from our school systems. And so we're going to have to double down on some of the things that we've been doing, working with our street outreach network, working with positive youth development, working with our Department of Recreation to provide more opportunities. That's why this high level meeting needs to happen. And it's going to happen next week because we need to throw everything at the wall on this one. Uh, this is where what we don't want is this to become a situation that's out of control. It is quite concerning right now, but it is not out of control. And we have an opportunity to stave this off because before it gets there. But what folks are saying in the community is they want to see us put forth action. And we are also saying to them that we need you to put forth action as well. This is an all hands on deck approach to really making sure that we're trying to address this to make sure that all of our residents feel safer and have better and secure access to great opportunities for their future, for themselves, their children, and their families as a whole. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Hey, can I just add something to that? I mean, uh, Craig, you, you make a really good point. I mean, there are a lot of adults in this community who have more contact with children in school than the county government ever will. And the conditions that are in the community are not products of things the county government did, and frankly, they're not products of things that the school system did. And this is going to require everybody to think about what are your roles in the community and how is everybody else talking to the children that are in their lives and in their community? If, if we think this is all going to come down to the government and having a silver bullet that I can put, you know, the right number of police in the right place and this will disappear, that's not going to happen. This ungluing of things is, is, a, is a deeper problem. And people are going to have to figure out, you know, what is the role of the community groups, faith groups, other groups, in terms of trying to create a sense of, you know, belonging and sense of possibility in kids. And I was a school teacher, and 
you know, I heard kids say things at the age of 10 that were actually, you know, pretty frightening to me because when they were talking about where they saw themselves going, um, they didn't see themselves going anywhere. I had some kids, honestly, you know, well, I won't even go into what they said. Um, it was, it was just disturbing. And we, we've got to figure out how as a community re-engage holistically. Um, you know, when we talk about the shootings, um, you know, we could, we can deal with crimes of opportunity. We can put more police out there. We can, you know, increase the presence and make people feel, you know, that this is not the kind of place where you want to commit a crime like that. However, so many of these crimes are personal and they're arranged meetings and the police are never going to be there for an arranged meeting in an apartment building or, or in the woods or stuff like that. So this is what makes this, you know, so daunting, you know, we could deal with the normal crime aspects of knowing what you do to, you know, make a place less hospitable to crime, but inter interpersonal interactions, that is not something that policing or anything else lends itself to. But this is a place where if friends know that friends are thinking about doing things, that they're trusting that there are people in the community they could go to and say, look, so-and-so is thinking about doing this, this, you know, the situation could blow up. That's the kind of information that would be really helpful to have. Got it. Thank you all very much again. Thank you, Kate. Next up, it's Corey Smith, NBC4. Good afternoon, Corey. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I have um, two questions. Uh, going back to the health officer search, uh, so with this, this latest person dropping out, are you all having to go back to the drawing board to your original pool of candidates? Or is it, you know, with three people now dropping out of the process, we go to our fourth choice or fifth choice. Uh, and then the second question um, related relates to rental assistance. If I'm not mistaken, uh, the cap on the uh, rent increase at 0.4% expired on Monday. Uh, and I know you guys also have a new round of rental assistance uh, that has started. Do you think one will impact the other? Do you, you know, what's the sense you maybe get from the landlord community uh, as, you know, rents rise, you know, across the region? Do you expect more people now uh, to be going for this pool of uh, rental assistance there in the county? So, Corey, I'll take on. I'll, I'll, Mark, go ahead. You want to start out? That's well, I, I was just going to say that, you know, we've not had a shortage of people who will go into the pool for rental assistance. Um, the truth of the matter is that the assistance because it's been limited, the number of amount of dollars we've gotten for this um, does not address, has not addressed ever all the people who need assistance. And so we've got a targeted population. We anticipate, I guess, and Raymond can talk more about that, you know, that I, you know, we, we will certainly exhaust the funds pretty much out of our targeted population. And if they don't, uh, we will expand it to a wider group. Um, I'm very concerned about rent increases. I'm gonna send over a recommendation that um, we extend controls for a period of time, but at a higher rate, because obviously 0.4% isn't gonna cut it, but you know, in, lieu, in light of the kind of what we're hearing about requests for rent increases, um, there are a lot of people who are gonna be losing their housing because of rent increases. Not paying the rents can be the least of their problems. They're not gonna be able to pay and cover the rent increases that may well be coming our way. And that's, that's another one of those things that helps unglue society when people can't find places to live. So I'm very worried about what's gonna happen. I would just add, yeah, I think that's right. And we are, we are, um, uh, we are open, we've opened up our, our second round of, of uh, our most recent round of rental assistance and we will run that until, it, it, uh, until we don't have any more funding in, in that pot. I do think that uh, the CE is right when he says we have no shortage of people who, who, are, who are needing assistance. The rising rents are going to put pressures on people. And I think that to the extent that folks don't get back to work and don't have uh, the economic wherewithal, that we're going to see a, a rising number of folks who are going to be struggling. We do have rental assistance programs and relief and, and assistance programs that will continue to run. Uh, we just can't tell at this point whether or not we're going to have capacity to meet the need. And of course, available availability of affording how affordable housing is um, at, at the heart of, of a lot of this, I think. And, and just a reminder that the money we have that's targeted, you know, this is still COVID relief. And so your job loss, you have to have job loss that's attributable 
the COVID, if you just simply can't afford the rent increase, but you're working and you know, you're know you already spending 50 to 60% of your income, this the federal funding is not meant to address that. So that's another, you know, hole in all of this. I, I hope that, you know, the landlord community recognizes what kind of havoc they could wreak if they, you know, maximize the rent increases as, as has been done in some other places. It will not be pretty. And if I can just uh, jump in uh, real quick, um, that a couple of things I wanted to note. So Donna, uh, for, for the members of the media, can you identify yourself, please? Sure, Thank you. sorry. Um, Alana Brands, I'm the Deputy Chief with Services to End and Prevent Homelessness within HHS, and we are administering the COVID rent relief program. Um, so just to touch on a couple of quick things, um, Corey, related to your question. So the uh, increase in rent, uh, rent charges, landlords do need to provide a 90-day notice for that. So that notice could start to go out on May 16th, but residents won't actually see those increases then until um, their September uh, rent bill. And our COVID rent relief program are around four, given um, everything that the county executive and Dr. Carl mentioned in terms of the uh, extensive demands on assistance that we're anticipating. Our application portal is actually only scheduled to be open at this point through June 30th. Um, so we will not actually see in this round of assistance those that may be impacted by future rent increases given the um, expiration of the, the required cap on rent increases. The other thing, uh, just note quickly, um, given the demand, we are only able to provide assistance in this round with arrears. And so again, it, um, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of challenges right occurring at the same time in terms of the um, tension on households that live paycheck to paycheck and are struggling each month uh, on their budget. But we'll, we will have to handle both of those a little bit differently. And we are working closely with DHCA to you know, monitor where we're seeing some of those rent increases to take the experience where, um, you know, with other areas and even some of our cities uh, within the county that it already expired. Um, and we do have our regular eviction prevention programming where we could assist households um, in that way too. So uh, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep an eye on it. And, and exactly as said, you know, we'll, we'll see, hopefully there will be opportunities for additional funds and we'll be able to open more rounds after this. And, continue to align um, the, the changing housing market with the assistance we're able to provide. Thank you, Lana. Is that good for you, Corey? Uh, yeah, and just, just real quick on the on the health officer, I guess, where, where, the, where does the process stand now? Are you all going back to the, to the drawing board or do you have another pipeline of four, fifth, six choices that, that you're ready to move forward with perhaps? So I would not say that we're ready to move forward with anyone who's in the list right now. We will be going back to our list of starting with a list of candidates and, and taking a closer look at some that we hadn't put forward, forward uh, earlier to see whether or not they would meet the criteria for, for, for going forward. We're also going to continue the search. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are going to continue to go back out nationally and use our search firm um, to, to extend and deepen our search. And, and after some conversation with the county executive and the, the county administrator, we're looking at options to, to maybe some strategies for potentially broadening the pool. Hey, real quick, one quick follow-up. Do you all have any sort of ballpark dollar figure on how much you've spent on this search thus far? I do not. Okay, no worries. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Up next, Steve Bonnell, but best of beat. Good afternoon, Steve. Afternoon. Um, Porter's asked some questions that had you know, encouraged me to ask this question. Uh, this could be for a law or county executive to start off. Uh, you mentioned that you now it's the 0.4% cap on the voluntary rent guidelines ended on Monday or Sunday, I believe, or the weekend. Uh, county executive, you mentioned a higher number than 0.4%. Do you have a number or is that still being finalized? It's not, it's not final. We're talking about it, but it's not finalized. It's, it's not going to be high but it's not going to be 0.4. Okay. Uh, I guess you don't like one, 2%. Am I, I don't want to guess or put a number. Don't, like don't guess. Save yourself the trouble. Okay. Um, Dr. Kroll, my colleague Dan does a really good job, so I don't want to insult him. But one of the things that's interesting about this uh, increase uh, in crime um, among young people is that, you know, obviously you're a trained 
psychiatrists and psychotherapists. So I'm wondering, I just want to pick your brain, you know, how COVID might have impacted this among younger people. And just given your training, I'm sure you've, you've kind of developed or kind of thought of some things that might be contributing to this, um, if that makes sense. So I don't know if you've seen anything or um, I figured you uh, have good insight on that. So so, so Steve, uh, just for the record, I, I, I will not be insulted by the fact that you called me a psychiatrist instead of a psychologist. Oh, uh, yeah, so I can mess that up. My, my apologies. This time. Um, <laughs> um, but the, the, yeah, you know, this is something I have been watching over the last, uh, working, working through over the last two years. I'm not aware of any particular uh, research that's directly connected to COVID around this, other than to say that, that there are uh, in a small number of cases, uh, long COVID can have some impacts on cognitive and emotional um, balance of, of people. So we don't know yet whether or not that is a factor in any of this, in any of this violence. So it's, it, would be, it would be speculative on my part to, 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 to assert that. Uh, I, I do wanna say, go back to what I said earlier about the level of isolation and disconnection um, from, from, uh, from, from people. Um, our young people have been disconnected in some ways, I think, well, let me back up and say they, they are, they remain remarkably connected digitally as they always have been, but there has always been alongside all of that digital connection, interpersonal connection and closeness that, that, that uh, we have uh, young people who have now lost that and lost a lot of that over the last couple of years, just because we've been isolated and, and from the normal ways and places in which they connect to each other. So we are seeing some increases, not just in violence, but in terms of, um, of, of depression and suicidality and, and anxiety and interpersonal anxiety uh, and, and conflict um, and emotional regulation. Um, I, I, I said to someone recently that you could, if I get angry in this, in this forum um, and, and want to say some things to somebody, I can turn off my mic, I can turn off my camera and no one would ever know what I'm saying on this side and I can just give vent. But when I'm in person, it requires a level of self-control and a level of emotional regulation um, we have we have eliminated some of that through teams over the last two years and through these through Zoom and, and various media. And now we're having to, to relearn those kinds of skills by being back in person with each other. And I think that's true for, for, for our young people as well. Well, thanks for that. Uh, shifting gears here. I think Sean addressed this and perhaps anyone on the health team can address this too about kind of the update on boosters for five to 11 year olds can you all just re reiterate, so there's a final approval coming tomorrow and then, or hopefully coming tomorrow. And I just want to know the county's kind of stance on rolling those boosters out. Is that going to happen in the schools like it did initially? Or I just wanted more information on that as we kind of get close here to that final approval. Steve, I, I can answer that. Um, yeah, so the we we know that ASAP's meeting tomorrow. Um, I, I don't have their full agenda, but I assume they're going to they're going to review this. Uh, I know the FDA did not even go to a committee to, to review the, the booster. They've already looked, both groups have already looked at the safety data for, for this vaccine, for this age group. It was, they're basically just looking at efficacy of giving a booster and um, FDA felt it, it should be, should happen. I don't see any reason why the CDC wouldn't agree. And the state has been very quick to update their, um, their uh, vaccine uh, guidance and, and orders. Uh, so I think that'll all happen pretty quickly. The, the part that's gonna take us a little bit is um, we have been trying to uh, avoid wasting vaccine through expiration or other things. So we have a very limited supply at the moment, um, a, a couple hundred doses uh, that we've scheduled for our clinics. We've been doing pediatric vaccines um, at the county clinics almost exclusively on the weekends because that matches up the best with the with parents and children's mutual availability to come out uh, to get them uh, their first two shots. Um, we we do have a couple sites. We continue to work with MCPS, and um, I know we'll be at some schools this weekend. Um, we'll probably exhaust the available vaccine uh, during that. I know we'll be at uh, Gaithersburg, I believe, on on Sunday. Gaither. Gaithersburg uh, High School, I think, or middle school. Um, in any event, we will we will circle back with MCPS and we'll likely uh, continue that partnership, continue doing uh, the booster shots through their through their school systems. 
it's been so, so helpful uh, to enable us to get to neighborhoods that we're not routinely in and get to the populations um, who aren't able to get to our sites. So yes, we we do plan to, to work with the schools on this. To clarify, if everything is green lighted, like you said, is the dosages, it's kind of getting in the weeds, but this weekend you could start at schools and other sites offering boosters or will that be next week and beyond? Well, we, we can, it'll be the same vaccine. Um, I assume, I'm, I shouldn't make that assumption. The reason we wait for the CDC is they'll tell us if it's the same dose. I, I'm, I'm thinking it will likely be the same dose. And so we, we just have to let our clinicians know that th this is now approved and do it uh, behind the scenes. Um, sometimes the, the state and, and their partners who work on the medical records, they, um, they update the system to record that a booster is now being done for that age group. But all that aside, we'll be ready to go immediately. The, the question is, when will we get an additional supply of, of vaccine so we can do a larger number? Um, reminding folks that uh, we don't have to wait for a new formulary. So private providers who have the pediatric vaccine, they can start giving it as well. Um, so we're a little bit, it's a little bit different setting than when it was first authorized and we all had to wait for it to come in. Um, we just need to wait for a, a resupply to handle the uh, expected increased demand um, now that boosters are recommended. So Steve, just to add uh, to, to Sean's uh, um, in-depth um, response, we also uh, wait to receive the clinical um, guidance from uh, the Maryland Department of Health as we've done before. And we communicate that clinical guidance to our community partners who have been instrumental in all of our vaccine efforts and to make sure that they have the technical assistance and guidance and are prepared. So all of that goes into our capability uh, operationally to uh, administer any vaccine. And just to add, because you didn't ask, we've been playing, uh, uh, planning for the six months to four-year-old vaccines as well with our community providers, our pediatrician and working with MDH. So we're ready not only for the five to 11 boosters, but once the, once the uh, uh, under five-year-old uh, vaccines are available, we will follow the same suit and be prepared to administer them as well. Dr. Bridgers, you stole my next question about the lower age group. I mean, I can look at the headlines too, but are we close to that? I know that was kind of anticipated sooner and then there was a delay and the last read I heard, Steve, was June, um, and I know Dr. Stoddard and I have been tracking it back and forth, uh, kind of doing our own quasi esti uh, estimates on when they will be available. So we're still tracking, I think, mid-June. And one of the interesting data points Sean went over is I think 63 to 64% of the 5 to 11-year-olds in the county are, are fully vaccinated. That's a high number. But I and correct me, you can all correct me if I'm wrong, but that's probably lower than you know seniors and other age groups that you all kind of analyze here. What have you been hearing or kind of how you kind of analyze that about why that number might be lower uh, than other age groups that have come forward to get the vaccine? You know, this is this is a national trend. It has even been a trend in our county, even with very high vaccination rates. Each subsequent group that is authorized, it's a it's a lower turnout. Um, some of that is likely because of lower uh, risk for serious illness, and so lower perceived risk um, may mean that you know there's there's uh, less urgency to to get the vaccine. Um, but you know our, our highest vaccinated group are our seniors, um, and and so on down the line. Um, you know, there's also, it, it could be that many of these individuals have gotten COVID and they, they don't think they need to get a vaccine. Um, what we've seen from uh, national peer-reviewed uh, evaluations, the vaccine provides a, um, a greater immunity than uh, simply contracting COVID. And so that's why we strongly recommend the vaccine. Um, and the and the boosters too, because both both uh, immunities wane over time. Um, so I think that that's some of what it is. You know, the I think it was um, I, I forget which uh, which news agency reported. At one point, uh, they looked at all of the C, all of the counties across the CD, uh, across the nation through CDC data, and they found that more than half of the counties in America had less than ten percent 
vaccination of that age group, which is just astounding. Um, it's very, very different from the parents. So it's it's uh, parents deciding not to to vaccinate their children or not seeing an urgency. Um, that's those numbers are very different when you look at the Northeast, where there's much higher vaccination rates. And so, um, again, that's what we're we're seeing here. But it is a little bit of a a, a lower rate. Um, it, you know, it's it's steadily creeped up over time, but um, but it is lower at this age group. Sean, it, we'll just add to that that, that there is a, a tendency. Um, all of us in this room probably know someone who's had COVID, who's, who's, who's contracted COVID within the last several months, over the last six months or so. And each and every one of us has someone who's contracted it and they've, they've lived through it. It's been a bad cold. The combination of our, vaccine, our vaccines and a less virulent form of the virus um, gives us some sense of, well, that just means it's okay. I mean, they, they'll get it, they'll be fine. It'll just, it'll just be a bad cold. And what they don't, what we don't see as individuals are the vast numbers, numbers that you and I are looking at, and we're talking about how many people is being, are being affected by that across the, the country. So there's a level of um, false security, I think, that 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 we that is that, that people are beginning to feel about COVID, and that makes them less anxious about getting vaccines, you know, seeking out a booster. Sean, you know, I just want to add on that was pretty. I'll try and find that article you mentioned, but about half of the counties for the five to 11s are as low as 10 percent versus, you know, that makes our number look a lot better. I didn't know that. But how much of that is how educator population is and kind of how, you know, we have a lot of national health care apparatus here. I just anyone can answer that, I guess. But that's kind of what jumped into my brain right away in terms of just that sheer difference. Yeah, I, I, I mean, we know that Montgomery County is one of the, the healthiest counties in America. You know, before we even talked about COVID, um, we have a, 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 high, a higher than average level of education in our county. Um, we have lots of great access to amazing hospitals. Um, we just, we have a lot of infrastructure here. And we have a lot of people who believe in taking care of their health and living a healthy lifestyle. Um, this is on average. And so that, that brings it all up. Uh, you know, so that that's, you know, that, that, those are certainly things that are helping us out, um, you know, in the overall, uh, in the overall vaccination rates across the board. Uh, I do think that there is, there's definitely a word of mouth um, phenomenon that we're seeing where when communities talk to each other in, in social settings and they talk about, did you get vaccinated? Did you get your kids vaccinated? Um, once you start seeing people do that, it, there, there's less resistance and it probably works the opposite way too. If you're in a community that um, uh, there's not a, a strong belief in vaccinations, it, it, it probably works against it. Um, I, I don't understand why there are communities with extremely high adult vaccinations and extremely low childhood vaccinations. Um, but that is fortunately not happening in our in our county. So Steve, I'm just gonna add a, a, a different um, opinion to that. Thanks, Sean. But also we have, uh, I know we've had many questions about having a permanent health officer, having a health officer, when are we gonna get a health officer? But I wanna just say that we have an exceptional cadre of health professionals on our teams, clinicians, epidemiologists, research scientists, internists, uh, specialists, pediatric doctors who help us shape and form the message. Dr. Kroll and, 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 and uh, our county executive, and even Dr. Stoddard, who is part of our core team, look for various ways to reach our community. We look beyond what's, uh, what's uh, uh, readily available or, or, or in the immediate uh, uh, future, I should say. So we go outside of those means to look at different ways. So if, if, if the feds and the state are saying something, we look at uh, county level metrics to increase our ability or response or capacity to expand. And so that's what we've been doing. That's been our success story and we will continue to do that. Thank you everyone. And thanks Sean for spending this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Next up, Kevin Lewis with questions for the County Executive, ABC7. Good afternoon, Kevin. 
Hi, good afternoon to all of you. County Executive, um, I heard that there's talk underway with the FOP and the police department to uh, budget in new uniforms for all sworn officers in the coming fiscal year. Is there truth to that? And do you mind telling me a bit more about where the idea came from and the cost and, and what types of uniforms are being looked at? Please, Mr. County Executive, please unmute. Sorry about that. Somebody asked me a question. You asked me about uniforms? Yeah, I understand that there's uh, ongoing uh, conversation uh, between yeah. no, uh, true. government. So, you know, one of the things in kind of reimagining police was reimagining the look of police. And there's a pretty broad consensus that the black uniforms are intimidating and they're meant to be intimidating and we don't want people to appear to be intimidating. And so we've been discussing with, um, with the department and with the union um, alternate colors uh, for, for police uniforms. And they're still in the process of deciding on a color for the, uh, for the rank and file police and as well as uh, colors for the management and when they settle on colors, then we'll be changing the uniforms over to, to different colors. Is there a department that comes to mind that uh, you're modeling after that has taken um, this reimagining approach where uh, a uniform appears to be less intimidating to the public? Uh, I can't say, I can't think of a department per se, but I know departments have gone, have changed uniforms and some departments have gone to lighter uniforms than, than they had in the past. I know this issue was raised actually with us originally by FOP, who thought that a change of uniform would be a good idea. Um, I happen to agree with it. I know that people in the community had similar thoughts. So I think it's, it's something that we, we ought to do and that will help take some of the intimidation out of the appearance of an officer. Roughly speaking, how much would this cost to uh, provide new uniforms to all 12, 1300 sworn officers? Um, depends how we roll it out and how we phase it in. You know, we replace uniforms anyway, so it's not like we don't buy uniforms. These would be just different colored uniforms. Um, but I, you know, we're still working on it. So when they know what it's going to look like, I'm sure we'll get pricing and we'll move down that road. Millions or more in the hundreds of thousands. I know there's different. I've ways. got a, I've got a, I've got over a thousand officers, so I'm guessing you, could, you know having uniforms for everybody is going to put us um, over a million dollars. I have flashbacks just picturing you know the uniforms during the sniper uh, you know, attacks from 2002. I believe those were more like lighter color, tan desert. Yeah colored uniforms. Um, do you know when the department went to the darker current look? I honestly don't know when they did that, but I'm, I'm glad you can remember back to what they were wearing during the sniper because I cannot. I do remember the lighter uniforms, but I don't associate it with that. And any difference in the, um, the way the uniform feels on the officer in terms of if it's more you know lighter breathing for the hot summer months or you know uh is that was it raised color or is it there going to be some actual different looks and and feels for officers and the public alike beyond color so i'll just say you know i haven't i'm not the one judging this this is something that we leave to the, the department and to the officers so i haven't gotten involved in the beauty contest of, of all that stuff um but the, but one of the points about being a lighter color is that a black uniform is hot and in the summer, it, it's just more uncomfortable. So this will actually should be a more comfortable uniform than the one they're wearing today. I'll just add in, Kevin, there's a Joint Health and Safety Committee that with the police and the, uh, the you know, the management and, and the FOP that reviews all the all the different materials they invest in. in they're in the process of investigating several different options. But yes, it is meant to be more light and breathable, 
more, uh, you know, obviously the amount of equipment, equipment that they have to carry has changed over time, has to make sure that the, uh, the new alternatives also offer different options for, you know, we've talked about pepper ball guns and, and other equipment like that to make sure that that'll all work in, in this new environment. Body cameras were not as uh, prevalent when the original um, uniforms were developed uh, or the conversions that had occurred. So there's lots of new uh, elements of technology and equipment that officers have we want to make sure that the uniform supports that mission as well. Is there a packet at the county council uh, yet that you know of, Earl, um, or has has the Public Safety Committee not held a formal meeting where this has been discussed to date? It hasn't. To my knowledge, it hasn't been formally transmitted or discussed at this point yet. It's just internally being discussed, and they're putting together a proposal. Uh, you know, what it might look like for us, the county executive said, you know, what the total cost will be, but also how, how that could be phased in over a period of time, recognizing you don't want you officers to look like different from one each other, different from one another, but you obviously don't need to replace every uniform. Um, you know, you have specialized units, you have other units you can do in certain orders. All right, gentlemen, I believe the county executive needs to go step out to his next meeting. We do have a couple more reporters that have questions. And I know Dr. Bridges has also a meeting at two o'clock. I hate to interrupt, but we need to move forward. Heather Curtis, WMAL, you have some questions. Bye, Mr. County Executive, you have to go. We will continue with the rest of the participants. Thank you. Bye, everybody. And see you again next week. Good afternoon, Heather. You have questions? Yes, hi. Yeah, hi. I have two, two separate questions. Um, the first one, um, obviously, this frustrating search for a health officer and not being able to, you know, get a candidate to stick around, accept the job. Best case scenario, how long will it take to hire someone? Hi, Heather. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a good question, actually. I'm glad you're asking that. Our typical search parameter around someone of a, a position at this level uh, at least my experience has been in the time I've been in, in the department is, is around six months um, to, to craft position, recruit it, uh, get through the interview process and, and make someone an offer that they ex accept and then do a nomination. And so, and then give them a chance to say goodbye to their old job and join us. So uh, six, maybe a little longer. So we're now at uh, going into eighth month, I think we're completing about our eighth month on this. So this is a little longer than we, we normally would have expected. Um, I, going forward, I think COVID has slowed some things down. I think the 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 the, um, the, the intense competition in the market has, has stretched it out in some ways that we didn't necessarily expect. So I'm guessing it's going to be several more months before we actually have a candidate um, in 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 the mix. Um, we're farther down the pipe because we have um, all the parts in place necessary to do the search. We just don't have the candidate that we think is is the right candidate for the job um, sitting at the at the door waiting on us right now. Thank you. And my other question is, um, obviously, there's uh, been a lot of talk about boosters uh, today, a second boosters, people are 50 and older are being urged to get those second boosters. I live in Montgomery County, I'm under 50. I'm looking at my booster card now, I got my booster in um, December. So I'm wondering, you know, for people under 50, who may want a, a second booster, but aren't eligible yet, are you concerned that that may um, lead to be fueling some of the spread because people like me, you know, my immunity is waning. Well, I, you know, I, I, I would have to defer on this one to the, the, the reviews at FDA and, and CDC. They, they are getting data from the vaccine manufacturers and they're looking at it at all age ranges. Um, and uh, the declining immunity it, uh, has, has, when they've looked at this previously, they've seen that it declines more quickly with, with the older populations, which is why they've, um, they've been the higher priority for the boosters. Uh, we don't have access to that, you know, that, that um, research data uh, um, and how it's impacting the younger populations. Um, so we would have to defer to their judgment on this uh, because we just don't have, have information about it. Um, what we have seen in our county though uh, is obviously um, those infections are, are higher um, you know, at this point during the phase, during, during this um, variant, but uh, the serious illness is not really um, occurring. And so it, 
that that may be supporting the you know the current strategies for boosters. Um, but you know if they if they come back and say, you know, no, we're we're going to recommend boosters now for the Sage Group, um, we certainly would, uh, you know, again defer to their judgment with the data that they're they're looking at. Thank you so much. And and, and just to, just yep. to follow on with that, there are <laughs> other groups that have that do have um, uh, more concerns about the immunity, and they are recommended for for boosters at younger ages, and including our immunocompromised populations. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Kevin. I forgot to thank you. We needed to get the county executive to his next meeting. We have one more follow-up question. Jack Moore from WTOP. Good afternoon, Jack. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. I know it's been a long briefing today. Uh, returning to the um, topic of COVID in schools, I, I understand that DHHS is providing recommendations to schools on when masks should be worn based on CDC guidance and MSDE guidance. But could you briefly, I haven't had enough coffee today. Can you just briefly in a nutshell, what are the recommendations for wearing a mask in school? So uh, great question, Jack. A um, couple, of, couple of comments. So when, we, so when we look at masking in school, we look at those outbreaks that are three or more in a classroom. And we also look at the percentage of outbreaks for unrelated cases in a school setting, which includes students, teachers, and staff. And so we work with our communicable disease and epidemiology team to identify those outbreaks through the MDH uh, uh, red cap system, which is a system where they report the number of outbreaks as reported through PCR or viral tests. Now we also work with MCPS to recommend those guidance. We wanna mitigate and suppress any, any further expo exposure, excuse me. So we look at masking options and recommendations. We know that mask, indoor wearing mask where there are tight spaces less than um, um, six feet or three feet um, um, may uh, uh, suppress those, those outbreak cases. So those are the recommendations that we have provided to MCPS regarding their school community. They know their school community and we work synergistically to provide the best practice for them. So that's where we are. That guidance was an interim guidance that was set forth back on March the 2nd in collaboration with the Maryland State Department of Education and the Maryland Department of Health. And a quick follow-up, sorry, uh, Dr. Bridges, earlier you mentioned the 5% threshold. Mm -hmm. so where does that factor in? So the 5% threshold is a percentage is based on the data that we receive from the Maryland Department of Health. So when we receive those data, we do the contact tracing, we follow up with MCPS, we identify those school settings, we identify those, those, those teachers, those students, and the staff. We make those recommendations to isolate if it's a positive case, if quarantine is, is necessary for those who are unvaccinated, and or other options that we continue to explore. One option could be a test to stay, but we are following up with the Maryland Department of Education to see if all of those relevant layer preventative measures are in place. So that 5% number specifically is in, uh, based on the guidance that we receive from MSDE and MDH. Because I see on the MCPS COVID dashboard, there's probably about a dozen schools that are above the 5% threshold. And MCPS, I believe, told us yesterday only one school has is doing masking school-wide. So I'm trying to figure out the disconnect there. So we provide the data based on outbreak. We follow up with MCPS regarding the information that we receive from the Maryland Department of Health about those outbreaks. So from HHS's perspective, we work with MCPS the numbers that they may report that may cause a disconnect, maybe those reported uh, numbers, those rapid tests or those tests that are reported to the schools. And so when they identify an outbreak to man manage and mitigate those outbreaks, they work with our CD&E team to identify the cases, to identify, which is called a line list, which is different from an outbreak list, which is what we receive from the Maryland Department of Health. So the numbers, the data reporting are different, which may seem like it's a disconnect, but our systems are talking. So where their dashboard may be reporting, we may have additional information that we share with MCPS to ensure that we mitigate and suppress any further outbreaks. Is that good? Thank you. Sorry. 
<laughs> thank you, Jack. Uh, thank you, everybody. I do not see any more questions from members of uh, the media coming point once, point twice. All right, I guess that's it for today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Council Member Craig Rice, for being our guest today. And uh, we'll see you next week. Stay safe. Have a great afternoon. Bye bye. Stay safe, everyone.